Since June, we have been learning about how to identify and then effectively work on ridding ourselves of character defects. Character defects are underlying character flaws that, if left unidentified and unaddressed, can lead to relapse for those in recovery. Now, these character flaws, they manifest themselves in these persistent behaviors uh, that, that compromise your ability to grow and progress in your recovery. Defects of character are undesirable traits, beliefs, and attitudes that make your life unmanageable. They cause pain to others and yourself and become obstacles that interfere with your moral, emotional, and spiritual growth. And we also have learned about character assets. Some of you told me you'd never heard of that. Well, character assets are attributes which a person possesses or acquires which are positive. These assets lead to moral, emotional, and spiritual growth. A person who replaces character defects with the opposite character asset. That's what we do. Now, most of you know that I am a huge sportsman. Does, does everybody know that in this place? Do you realize that? I'm a, I'm a huge MMA fan. I love boxing. I love football. I especially love NBA basketball. I just love sports, all right? Well, there's one thing I hate about sports, and hate's a really strong word, but it's kind of true. I cannot stand prideful, cocky athletes. These athletes say some of the most stupid and arrogant things imaginable. Here's, here's a few examples. Cristiano Ronaldo, he's a, he's a sports, he's a soccer figure, Here's his cockiest quote. He said, God sent me to earth to show people how to play football. Yeah, he's God's gift to soccer. Barry Bonds, which he's pretty famous for some other things, he said, it's called talent, people. I just have it. I can't explain it. You either have it or you don't. Yeah, exactly. Listen to this one, Chael Sonnen, he's, a, he's an MMA star. He said, I want an easy fight. I want Anderson Silva, Vanderlei Silva, either of the Silvas, Bigfoot Silva. They all suck. Give me a Silva. I said, suck in church. That's not good. <laughs> I'm just quoting him, right? So what a quote, huh? By the way, he's, he is not that good either, by the way. Now, here's a famous one. Neon Dion Sanders. He played football and baseball. He wasn't that great at baseball. He was okay, but listen to his cockiest quote, though. Sure, we're in limos. We are stars. How else is a star supposed to travel? How about by bus, right? And then here's a boxer that shall not be named, and I'll tell you why you cannot name him, because if you name him, he sues people, which is crazy. He's a boxer, and I bet you can figure out who this is. He says, yep. I'm better than Muhammad Ali. Sugar Ray Robinson, yep. I'm better than Sugar Ray Robinson. I would never say there's another fighter better than me. Who do you think that is? Who? <laughs> I'm shocked. And then lastly, here's my favorite, and I really didn't like him when I was a kid, but I kind of like him now. Muhammad Ali. I'm not the greatest. I'm the double greatest. Not only do I knock him out, but I pick the round. And he did, by the way. He was, he was pretty good. But, but here's the deal. Pride is not a good thing. Pride is defined as a deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements. The achievements of those with whom one is closely associated or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired. Now, when you first hear that definition, your thoughts are, well, you know what? That doesn't really sound that bad. It's okay to find pleasure or satisfaction from your achievements or possessions that you've accumulated. What's wrong with that? Well, let me first address the fact that there is such thing as healthy pride, okay? Um, you know, I, I will say this. I think pride uh, in your achievements in recovery, you should be proud of that. Um, because, you know, you've, some of you, if you've been sober today, you should be proud of that. 
If, if you have learned, if you were once a, a jerk and you're now a happy person, you should be proud of that. If you were once a, a, a pagan, I call them, like I was, and now you're following Jesus, you should be ultra proud of that. But pride can become a deep-seated defect of character that can lead to additional character flaws. Pride is another one of what I refer to as our core character defects. These are character flaws that, that they birth additional defects of character. These are bad character flaw, flaws that seem to grow other bad character flaws. And I do want to pause again, and I just want to re remind you that don't be afraid to be proud of the right kinds of accomplishments. Now, unhealthy pride, how do you know if it's, it's, it's actually creeping into your life? Well, we turn to our guidebook for living to learn how to, first of, all, first of all, identify it and how to get rid of it. And this is a story. There are scores of scriptures that address pride. And one of the, my, the most famous stories in the Bible about unhealthy pride is in the Gospel of Luke. It's Luke chapter 18. It's right there in your bulletin. Do me a favor right now. I'd like you to get out your bulletins, follow along with me. I think it's extremely important. This is called the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray, and one was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. Now that Pharisee stood by himself, and he prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like those other people, the cheaters, the sinners, the adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of my income. Now, before we get started, do me a favor. And I said this last week. If you got your phone out, I want you to sit your phone down. I really do. I want you to put it on the floor. I want you to pay close attention to this. Because this is an extremely important message for every single one of us. Every one of us struggle with some form of pride or another. And tonight we're going to learn and how to spot the signs of pride. But before we talk about that, I have a question for you. Who in this room or is watching online thinks that you're humble? Raise your hand. Okay, those are not humble people. That was rude, wasn't it? But here's the deal. If you think you're humble, you've already lost it. I had a good friend of mine say, man, I am the most humble guy you'll ever meet. And I just laughed out loud. Because here's the deal. That's not what humility is about. Okay? And so I'm going to teach you all. And, 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 and I didn't mean to do that to hurt your feelings. But you really need to pay close attention. Here's verse number 9. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness. The first sign of pride is you think you're superior to others. You think you're superior to others. You say things like this. I'm glad I only have an alcohol problem. At least I'm not a junkie. But, but in all reality, your life is following, falling apart and you're about to lose your job. I've never cheated on my wife. But you secretly look at porn, and it's having devastating effects on your marriage. Look at that homeless person over there. He needs to get a job. But you're upside down, down on your debt, and you pretend to have your finances in order. The Apostle Paul warns in Romans 12, 3 of the dangers of pride. He says, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think of yourself better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. In other words... Don't think of yourself in earthly standards, but instead through godly standards. When you look at yourself through that lens, listen, folks, you're not that great. 
Now, look at the rest of verse 9. And scorned everyone else. Another sign of pride is you criticize others. Rather than looking at your own faults and shortcomings, you wrongfully evaluate others. In his book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, author Richard Carlson wrote, when we judge or criticize another person, it says nothing about that person. It merely says something about our need to be critical. Ouch. You know, the root of criticize, criticism, excuse me, is criticism is pride. And as I mentioned earlier, core character defects, they, they birth other character flaws. A critical spirit is an ugly character defect born from a heart filled with unhealthy pride. It can become a dominating trait that leads to a nasty disposition. You know that you struggle with pride when you find fault in others, but you ignore your own. The fair, here's verse 11. Let's, let's move right along. I know you like that. That sounded good. Verse 11 says, The Pharisee stood by himself, and he prayed this prayer. I thank God that I'm not like those other people, those cheaters, those sinners and those adulterers. I'm certainly not like that, care, that tax collector. Listen, friends, it's a snowball effect. Pride leads to a critical spirit, and a critical spirit leads to the next sign of pride, which is you judge others. Now, as that snowball rolls downhill, it gains steam, and it grows into this giant cluster of character flaws and it's hard to stop once it gets rolling the bible has a stern warning for those who judge others listen to matthew 7 1 through 3 it says judge not that you not be judged for with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged and with the measure that you use it will be measured to you why do you see that speck in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log in your own eye. When you judge others, you're setting yourself up for your own judgment. Did you get that? You're setting yourself up for your own judgment. Not from man, but from God himself. And his judgment, trust me, it will be just. And it'll be measured according to how you judged others. That's a pr pretty painful reality, isn't it? Okay. I know you like that one too. All right. Luke 18, 12. Let's move right on. Luke 18, 12 says, listen to this. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. The last sign of pride that we learned from this parable is that you brag and you boast. There's nothing more telling about the condition of a prideful heart than someone who loves to boast and brag. And like the Pharisee, the prideful person often disguises their words. The prideful man or woman boasts of accomplishments, intelligence, success, generosity, their lineage, their beauty, and anything else that might point to the attention to the most important in his or her world. Who do you think that most important person is? Self. Here's the principle. Pride directs the attention to self, not Jesus. I know you're already, uh, <laughs> I think I've already got, I've stepped on some toes, haven't I, tonight? Yeah. Um, and you might be saying right now, you might be saying, Pastor Lane, I think you're wrong about me. I help lots of people. I do all kinds of good things. Can I get a little credit for the good that I do? Well, listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6. He says, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. 
But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what the right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. I want to pause for a minute. One of the biggest mistakes we do is when we do something good and charitable, we'll say, you know what? I gave $5,000 to so-and-so, or I gave, I did this or that. And here's the issue with that. That does not direct people's attention to the one who gave it all. That directs attention to self. And it's all about building up your own ego, okay? So what you do is you do the opposite of that. Frankly, um, you, you, you don't even talk about the amount you give. Does that make sense? You're not convinced yet? Listen to Jeremiah 9, 23. It says, this is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom or the powerful boast in their power or the rich boast in their riches. In other words, don't brag about how super smart and cool you are. Right? And you want some more convincing? You guys ready? Another left hook, right cross? Proverbs 27, 2 says, let someone else praise you. Not your own mouth, but a stranger not your own lips okay we are not that awesome okay we're not let's stop with all the the self gratification and the selfies and point to the one who made us all let's let's be focused on jesus yeah, how about instead of posting all these fun little... What, hey, i got to ask people this. What's with the duck lips anyway? Okay, that's another argument. There we go. I really offended somebody. But my point is, what is all that about? How about we, we, we put pictures of Jesus there and talk about what he's done in our lives? Let's, let's take pictures of people who are struggling and, and not, not to... to, to uh, you know, put their picture all over the Facebook and such, but say, this is somebody we need to help, okay? Let's do that instead. Listen to this. In recovery, pride is dangerous. And when pride is allowed to grow, it rears its ugly head in other ways. Here are some additional signs of pride. You defend your bad behaviors and your actions. When you're, you're a horse's patoot, you, you, you point to somebody else. You pretend it's not as bad as it, it appears. Oh, I don't drink that much. I, I, only, I only drank a couple beers. Oh, I only occasionally look at porn. Oh, I just have a little bit of credit card debt all the while. You've got $27,000 in credit card debt, right? Ooh, I'm, I'm on one, aren't I? You hide and you conceal what's really going on. That's a form of pride. You blame others and, and the circumstances. Remember, when you're blaming others, you got those, those other, what, three or four fingers pointing back to you. You minimize and say that you don't have a problem. You think you're right and they're wrong. You exaggerate in an effort to make yourself look good. Do you know what pride really is rooted in? And this is, isn't in my notes. Insecurity. When you're in security, you're going to try to pretend that you are all that in a bag of chips, right? How about we admit that we're all just broken people that, that need a Savior? How about that? So here's, here's a question. So what's the answer? What's the answer to ridding yourself of pride. How do you dispose of this unhealthy core character defect? Well, you replace the character defect of pride with the character asset of humility. So here's the steps you take. First, admit that you struggle with pride. Admit it. Say, man, I, I, am, I, am, I am a very proud individual. I struggle with pride. Pride is like denial in that it's very dif difficult to confess that you struggle with it. Pride is not only a character, de character defect. Listen, it is a sin. It's a sin. 
So don't try to hide it. Turn from your pride and, and embrace humility. Listen to Proverbs 28, 13. It says, people who conceal their sins, they won't prosper. But if they confess and they turn from them, they will receive mercy. Just say, Jesus, I, I suffer with pride. I want to be more like you. And guess what? You're moving towards humility. When you admit your pridefulness, you're beginning the practice of humility. And as a result, you'll start the process of growing in humility. You see, pride is all about self. In order to replace pride with humility, the next step is to develop a others first mindset. An others first mindset. You've probably heard this. Um, addicts and alcoholics are extremely selfish. Um, come to think of it, most people in general think of themselves first. The Apostle Paul taught the complete opposite. Listen to Philippians 2, 3 through 4. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Looking, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now, here are a few ways that you can develop an others first mindset. First of all, consider what others are going through and be sensitive to the suffering of others. Assume the good of others rather than the bad. Focus on giving people the benefit of the doubt instead of always looking for fault. Give credit to others rather than to yourself. You know, it's, it's awesome when you can, if you're working on a team, a good leader, for example, always does this. He'll say, man, people will say, man, you, you guys, you did great. And, and a, good, a good leader, a good team member will say, man, I have got the most awesome team in the world. Without them, I'm nothing. And here's something I want to share with you. I have got the most awesome team in the world here. Let's, in fact, let's give them a hand. Because I could do none of this without my awesome team members. And I, I'm just kind of a talking head. They make me look good. Here's another one. Learn to be content. Learn to be content. Be happy with what you own and what you have. Be happy when others succeed or have more than you. There are several of you in this room that need to hear that. You do not need the latest toy. You do not need the latest truck. You do not need the biggest house on the block. You do not need the most beautiful spouse. You do not need the, the largest amount of credit card debt. Okay? What you need is Jesus at the center of your life. That's what you need. Be content with what you've got. If, if all you have is, is a small one-bedroom apartment and you get $700 a month and you're barely making ends meet, listen, you're richer than almost the entire world. Be content with what you have. Be content knowing that Jesus is going to provide for you. And then focus on loving others even when they're unlovable. Boy, that's a hard one. You know that ex-spouse that you just really don't like? Focus on loving them from afar, okay? Do you know that boss that treats you like garbage every time you turn around? Focus on speaking good things about him or her. Focus on, on loving the, the person that is completely different from you. Focus on, on loving people who have so much more than you do. Focus on that person that absolutely, when you see him walking down the hall, you turn the other way. Because when you do, you're ridding yourself of pride. And you're beginning the process of becoming a humble servant. Here's the principle. And this is one I really, I love this. Turn your me into we. Turn, turn your me into we. Let me explain. Recovery is not a me program. Recovery 
is a we program. Pride says it's all about me. Humility says it's actually about we. We need one another. We need to think and care about each other. And when you recognize your me-focused pride creeping in, turn your attention and focus on the we instead of the me. When you begin to develop an other's first mindset, you're on the pathway to losing your pride and gaining humility. Now, here's another step in replacing your pride with humility. It's pray. Pray. And don't just go through the motion with with prayers that lack intensity or conviction. Instead, pray with intentionality and consistency. Now, what does that mean? Okay. It's not in my notes, but I'm going to tell you what that means. So, So when you are trying to rid yourself of pride, be intentional about praying specifically, specifically about prideful actions in your life. Tell God exactly the examples of what what you're doing and you recognize that are prideful. And then do it on a daily basis. Do it five times a day if you need to. Because you're never going to rid yourself of this horrible, unhealthy pride if you don't consistently and intentionally pray about it. 1 Thessalonians is very simple. In In chapter 5, verse 17, it says, pray without ceasing. What does that mean? Pray a lot. Don't stop praying. Pride is one of the greatest stumbling blocks in your ongoing long-term sobriety. You must treat it with seriousness and with conviction. Pride also affects your ability to point others to Jesus. We talked a little bit about that. And there's nothing attractive or compelling about a pompous, self-focused Christian whose attitude and behavior looks more like the world than that of our Savior. Family, humility reflects the love and the compassion of Jesus. You know what? You can't look like Jesus when you're just a jerk and you're full of yourself. But when, what did Jesus do? Think about his life. Jesus served. And that's the last step of ridding yourself of pride. Serve. One of the greatest ways that you can grow in humility is to serve others. And I know I speak about this almost every single week here at Care and Recovery. But there's a reason for that. Service puts you in a position of submission. You're submitting to the needs of others rather than your own. You know, nothing in the world will break your prideful attitude faster than doing a menial task. If you find that you struggle mightily with pride, get a commitment here on Tuesday night that will not put you in the spotlight. So here's here's an example. If you're a person who likes a lot of attention, let's have you wash dishes or sweep up the floor at the end of the night. Or work in the media department where nobody can see you. Or work up up top, okay, and and help with the sound, okay. Um, Dish out ice cream. Um, Clean up at the end of the night. Do child care, okay. We need need people in child care once a a month, desperately. There's nothing that will get rid of your pride than a dirty diaper, people. Poopy bums, man, pride's out the window. Oh, I had the, (laughs) that was kind of weird. That that sound effect, that was interesting. There we go. (laughs) We we can also use help in celebration place, grade school age kids, see our teens. You know what, I'll tell you, teenagers, you guys can... You can help us with our humility, can't you? All right? You know, one of the most beneficial things that I ever did, and you've heard this a, a bunch of times, and some of you maybe haven't. When I first got sober, I, I did dishes in a room alone. And it was just me and God. I had the, on, on the, on the, the uh, television was the, the service was going. And when the service was over, there'd be some worship music going. 
Nobody was there to say, hey, Lane, you're doing a great job. Nobody was there to thank me. In fact, most people didn't even know I was in the room. And for the first time in my life, I learned to become humble and obedient. And, and I didn't expect any, anything in return. And if you're struggling right now with pride and you need to grow in humility, just go and serve others. Mark 10, 45 says, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Tonight, I'm going to give you the opportunity to start the process of replacing the core character defect of pride with the character asset of humility. There's an insert in your bulletin, and we do this a lot, but I want you to pull this out. There are literally, if I look around and I see this group of people tonight, most of you don't serve, okay? I know who does, but most of you don't. So tonight, what I'm going to ask of you is I want you to, to really exchange this prideful behavior with humility by serving. Now, some of you are going to say, well, Pastor Lane, there's not a lot of things on there that I can do. What I want you to do is fill out your name, your email address, your phone, and the best way to contact you. And if you don't know where to serve, just put on there, I'll serve anywhere. Okay? If you really struggle with pride, here's what I want you to do. If, if you, and, and you know you do. Listen, I knew I was very prideful. Okay? Um, so if you really struggle with pride, I want you to pick one of those things that aren't going to get you any attention. Okay? And we will get you started immediately. I want to have the very biggest showing this, this month, um, this time, as far as people signing up than ever. Our ushers, they don't know I'm asking them to do this, but I want you to get up, go to the end of the rows, and I want you to pick up these as people fill them out. Now that, that means you're going to have to actually fill them out, people. So if you're not currently serving, um, please, please do, okay? Fill this out. And, um, and as you're filling those out, I want to pray for you. I want to pray that the God will reveal to you the areas that you struggle the most in. Lord, I... Uh, Lord, I know there are a lot of people in this room right now and watching online who are completely lost in their pride. Some of them don't even, they're not even aware of the magnitude of the prideful behavior. And Lord, I pray that you'll, you'll reveal to them an area that they can get the help that they need. Lord, will you show them specifically areas in which they, they struggle? If they're judgmental, Lord, I want you to show them. And God, tonight I, I pray that every person that's not serving they'll get involved in service so that you can work on their hearts. And God, I look forward to the coming weeks and months to us breaking the cycle and the chains of prideful behavior and replacing it with humility. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, I've got some good news for you. Because you've made the decision to grow in humility and a after share groups, we are going to eat some ice cream like I said earlier. I, hey, that's something to celebrate. And we're going to serve you some delicious ice cream because you're choosing to serve others. So we're going to serve you. But before we go to groups, I want you to stand up to your feet. Stand up to your feet. Make sure you're filling out those forms and handing them down. And I want you to raise your hands to Jesus right now. All you people sitting down that are, are filling it out, go ahead and fill those out first. Raise your hands to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm going to make room for you so that I can get rid of my pride. Let's try it one more time. Lord, I'm going to make room for you so that I can get rid of my pride. And let's do it louder. Lord. I'm going to make room for you so that I can get rid of my pride. I make room for you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Let's give him a hand and let's worship the Lord tonight.